Simon, it is a very big week for reviews. Uh, this week, you're going to take a look at Civil War, the brand new movie hitting the cinema screens. Uh, you're also going to take a look at the late night horror film, Late Night with the Devil. Uh, I've got a couple yep. of TV shows, The Sympathizer, which is a new HBO joint, uh, and Franklin, which has uh, Michael Douglas wearing some very fancy prosthetics, and that's debuting wow. on Apple TV+. Plus. <laughs> Look, there's some you know exciting stuff here, but do you want to kick us off? Let's maybe start with Civil War and let's just throw to a clip. All across America, critics are raving about the movie event of the year. It is American, 100%. That's what I'm talking about. Cool. We're going to DC. Are you serious? The United States are vaporized. They shoot us on sight in the Capitol. I've never been scared like that before, and I've never felt more alive. Uh, maybe this is the first film to come out in 2024 that's got everybody really buzzing about its point of view, and that's not often a thing that we have to deal with um, when we're talking about Hollywood films, but Alex Garland's new film, you know him from uh, Ex Machina. Alex Garland did 28 Days, uh, 28 Days Later, I should say. Um, he's made some terrific films over the years. In his latest one, he imagines a near future in which uh, California and or sort of parts of California and the state of Texas have combined to create uh, uh, an armed force that is then taking on the fascistic um, president of the United States and the world that he runs. So um, while it's a little bit of a long bow to pull to say that it's taken from today's headlines, it certainly uses um, the current state of politics in the US and the fragility of democracy as a, as a backdrop to the story of four journalists. This is more a film that has... Um, links to other movies like The Year of Living Dangerously or Salvador, the Oliver Stone film that looks at journalists embedded in a war zone. And uh, that war zone happens to be the American mainland. Um, Kirsten Dunst is out front of this group of four um, as the sort of the, the hardened combat journalist. Uh, she takes on board the young Kaylee Spanny, who, um, you know what, I saw her in Priscilla, but that movie was such a, a, a blank slate in, in terms of what it gave her to do. I don't remember her faith, and that's a terrible thing to say. Whereas in Civil War, Kaylee has this incredibly uh, warm um, innocence that you start to see crumble as the film goes on. And it's one of the great young actor performances that I've seen in, in, in recent years under the tutelage of Kirsten Dunst, who gives maybe her most grown up and most richly textured performance as the uh, the veteran photojournalist going into a war zone. So it is essentially a road movie where these four journalists are trying to get from uh, uh, one point in the middle of the country uh, down uh, through West Virginia and then into Washington, D.C. to interview the crumbling president played by Nick Offerman, who we only see at the start of the film and then at the end, um, but he is obviously the focus of, uh, of their main goal. And on this road trip through America, they meet the different types of Americans who have been divided by the war, who are ignoring the war, trying to live on as if there was nothing going on, um, and those that are in completely energised uh, in their points of view. That is exhibited in one of the most chilling scenes I've seen in a long time by Jesse Plemons uh, as a uh, radical militia type who manages to get the four journalists alone and horrible things happen. So you have a war zone movie. Um, what makes it so convincing as a war zone movie is that um, the, the fairly recent footage of the January 6th insurrection and the very recent footage coming out of places like uh, Ukraine um, where we see modern buildings and modern uh, metropolises being reduced to waste. In Civil War, Alex Garland does that with, you'll see a JC Penny, but it's on fire and has been largely um, broken down. You'll see a Walmart with exploded helicopters and tanks out the front. So there is very much the, the, the images of war that we're used to, um, but in this very American setting. And what that does it is, is it gives it a sense that this could happen so easily. This could happen 
in the blink of an eye, given the current political climate. Having said that, civil war isn't particularly a politically driven film. It doesn't take a specific stance as to who's right and who's wrong in this civil war. Clearly there's villains and, and clearly there's heroes, um, but it's very much a war placed in the American heartland uh, and mainland just as it would be in any other part of the world. The, 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 the sensation is it's just how easy this could happen. We don't expect California and Texas to join up in a war, um, but as it's positioned in this film, they do. And the politics of that are touched on and you sort of can understand why it's happened, but really, this is really the story of the, the four journalists. Um, it softly, softly treads through the actual combat of a civil war in the first half of the film, but the last 30 minutes it unleashes some of the most torrid war action when they finally get to Washington, D.C., that you'll see. Um, I'm not on the payroll, but I did see this at the IMAX theatre and the thumping sound system puts you right in the middle of the the, um, the war zone and the combat as it happens. So uh, this is a very potent, very powerful film um, that's not going to answer any questions about what's wrong with America and its and its very shaky democracy at the moment. But it is going to tell you that if we do, it does sort of get the message across that if we don't do everything we can do to sort out what is wrong, this is where we might end up. And um, that's a, that's a pretty good message um, in and of itself. So Civil War is in wide cinemas. You might come out of it with your own point of view as to, to what the film's politics are and that, that I guess that will be more about what you take in and how you want to uh, interpret certain scenes and certain characters. Um, but for me, it's just a, a cracking uh, drama um, about these four characters and uh, in, in that regard, it's, a, it's an apolitical statement that still packs a real punch. Yeah, look, I do wonder about this film in that it's 2024. There is a election later in the year in the US that has fairly significant consequence to not just the future of the US, but also you know the state of the world generally. Releasing a movie like that this year, like it just kind of seems like it's fraught with the obvious sort of concerns of audiences not quite really willing to go there for this kind of thing at the moment. Hmm. Or the other way in that, they're all terrified and maybe to work through those fears and and deal with what might come about if the worst aspects of American society rear up and, and get what they want, um, then this might be exactly what they need to see. So, yeah, whether they respond to it. It's not an easy watch at times because it does show the horrors of war very much in a modern American setting and that hasn't been seen since the Civil War. <laughs> Um, the, 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 the first civil war, I guess you could say. Um, so to give that kind of texture to the American society is, is at times really shocking to watch. Yeah, I kind of feel at times like this, people are after escapism and not necessarily something which is uh, going to help them process. Uh, that happens mm. after. But anyway, Simon, speaking of the civil war, this takes us right into what I'm talking about next, uh, Franklin which is a brand new HBO drama starring one Michael Douglas. You are, I am, Benjamin Franklin. The Congress has sent me here as a representative of the United States to elicit France in our war against England. America requires men, money, and arms. Without your aid, the United States will end before it has begun. Look, Simon, obviously this is post-Civil War. Uh, look, I, I don't know about you, but uh, constant listeners, if you're anything like me, congratulations, you're a really cool guy. Uh, but, you know, maybe you're not necessarily cracking open the history books as frequently as um, other more middle-aged people, maybe. Uh, look, I'm, I'm a poor history student, okay? Like, I know enough to get by, but I wouldn't say that I'm deeply sort of interested in some of the intricities of history. Usually when I get exposed to this, it's by way of the latest HBO drama. Uh, think about, say, maybe John Adams from HBO. I learned probably more right. there about the founding of the United States than I have from anything else. Um, and it's not like there's a shortage of literature about that. Like, I suddenly, you know, once it's on the screen, I'll watch a bit of that. Uh, you get it, you what, else, 
Yeah. When I was watching the John Adams miniseries on HBO, I heard about the midpoints, and at that stage, they go off to France for a little bit, and they bump into one Benjamin Franklin over there. Mm-hmm. And when I was watching, I was like, oh, I don't know that Benjamin Franklin spent a couple of years living in France. Apparently, he was there he for eight be. years, and that eight years is the focus of this new Apple TV Plus drama called Franklin, starring Michael Douglas as Benjamin Franklin and Noah Dupe as his son. Now... When I was watching this, the one thing that really um, just hit me from like maybe about five minutes in is I kind of feel like I've already seen a version of this and I enjoyed it a lot more and it was called John Adams. Uh, This obviously, you do see John Adams in this miniseries, but that isn't the focus of the series by any chance. And this is certainly a lot lighter on its feet and a little bit more uh, cheeky. There is a sequence in the very first episode where... Uh, Benjamin Franklin talks about the enjoyment he experienced from a fart. Uh, so, look, this this is maybe not necessarily the highest of brow uh, productions, but like it's certainly a high brow, classy production that looks and feels a lot like that John Adams miniseries. Now, I did a little bit of research in that I did the least amount of research I possibly could into this, and the reason why both these things look and feel exactly the same is that they're written by the same guy, Kirk Ellis. There we go. Uh, with yep. Franklin, he's also joined by Howard Corder, but the original um, John Adams series was just Kirk Ellis flying solo. But also as a producer on this, uh, and amongst the many names, is one Richard Plepler, the former head of HBO. So it's very much him just getting the gang back together to film themselves a bit more American um, why, history. Why can't I remember who played <clears throat> John Adams? Who was it? Well, it was somebody really significant. It was. It was one Paul Giamatti. Oh, of course. It was right in his sort of that yeah. big Giamatti moment, the sideways and all that sort of stuff. Okay, yes, I do remember it all now. Yep. No, exactly. And it's not like Michael Douglas is not a, you know, strong lead for a TV series. I mean, he proved that from the streets well, of San Francisco onwards. Uh, but, sure. you know, we, we all like Michael Douglas and like he's perfectly fine here, but this is a series that looks and feels just like that John Adams series, only not quite as good. And it's sort of a little bit of, let's just sort of, you know, replay the hits. It's not really a show that sort of stands on its own where you could watch this and feel as though you're really getting a fulfilling experience out of it because it just kind of feels like an well, echo, which is unfortunate. It's interesting. And, that- sorry, so I'm just one thought and then we can just go wherever. Uh, I just want yep. to say that if you are interested in history and you enjoy a historical sort of biopic series like this, you're probably going to find a fair bit to like in this. But as someone who is looking at this, one part for entertainment and the other parts just get a little bit of insight as to what's going on, the entertainment side of it just kind of let me down a little bit. It's not quite as energetic as John Adams. The performances aren't really quite as charismatic. And this just kind of feels a little bit flat. It's interesting that Michael Douglas has been cast because Benjamin Franklin uh, was known... At different times, is a bit of a pants man. I think his eight years in Paris and eight years in France sort of added to that uh, sort of notion of the man. And Michael Douglas is well and truly known as one of the great Hollywood Lotharios. Um, so there's a, a there's a little bit of glee in that kind of casting, and, and might make it interesting to watch as well. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm keen to have a look at this big Michael Douglas fan. Um, who does uh, Noah Dupe? I don't know. Why should I know who Noah Dupe is? Uh, it's one of those names that you kind of see around the place. Uh, it's, he was it's one exactly of the sons in. Well, he was in Ford versus Ferrari. as one of the kids. Uh, he was in a quiet ah, okay. place. Right. You know, the boy, and a quiet place oh, yeah, part okay. two, also playing the same boy. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that sounds interesting. He was, he was the kid in The Undoing, which was that mini series with Nicole Kidman and uh, yep. Hugh Grant. Years ago, which started out really strong and ended. Okay, so Franklin is on Apple TV as we speak. Mm. Um, Mm. If you love your big period dramas, then this could be something to tune into for a bit of a comfort watch, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh, but on a similar note, as a bad yes. student of history, suddenly I found myself deep into the Vietnam War with the new HBO drama called The Sympathizer. Biracial, bilingual. That was a synthesis of incompatibilities. So what did I do? Welcome to the world of spycraft. Get down! Saigon, 
1975. I was a man of two faces. You are the only one I can trust. The war was ending. Yo! And I awaited my new assignment. My protege. Jesus. So where are we going? To next harbor on your CIA voyage. America. Simon, I've talked about being a bad student of history, but frankly, I know a lot about the uh, Vietnam War, and that's largely because sure. I watched Air America, starring Mike, uh, Mel Gibson oh. and Robert Jeez. Downey Jr. from 1990, I think the film yep. was. That was yes, a fun-sided I mean, the Vietnam War. Yes, yeah, so I practically know everything there is to know about the Vietnam War. Or at least I thought <laughs> I did. And then suddenly I'm confronted with this black comedy series from HBO called The Sympathizer, uh, the Sympathizer, look, this has some pretty major talent behind it. Uh, Park Chan-wook is the co-creator of the series and wow. yep. director on it. Uh, he is a uh, co-writer and director. One of the main people that he's working with here is Don McKellar, who people know as a Canadian actor, but also a screenwriter and director in his own, um, you know, um, as well. Uh, Don McKellar, responsible for one of my favorite movies, uh, this really great film called Last Night. Uh, also made a TV series that's near and dear to my heart called Twitch City, which is about a guy who's a shut-in that just watches a lot of TV. Uh, I'll let you guess why I might be a bit interested in that one. <laughs> but anyway. Say, that's not doesn't fall too far from the tree there. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, so look, I, I don't quite know how Park Chan-wook and Don McKellar found themselves in each other's orbit, but I'm glad they did because this is a real um, highly engaging, very entertaining, as I said, historical black comedy drama. Uh, when I went into it, for some reason, I thought it was a half hour, but it's not. The first episode is well and truly in that HBO level 48 minutes um, drama. The thing, though, is uh, if you read the blurb as to what the show is, it kind of gives away where the series is heading. And when I watched that first episode, I hadn't read anything about the actual sub uh, subject. I knew that it was in the Vietnam War, but I didn't really know exactly what it was about. And so I actually found myself doing something which I find so rarely when I watch TV in that I was actually genuinely surprised. I didn't know where things were heading. I couldn't really anticipate what the show is going to be about going forward. I didn't know where we'd be. I didn't know how it was going to be structured. Like, I really am just deep into the mud. And that was one of the enjoyable things about this. So... I'm going to give you the first half of the log line behind it, but I'm not going to tell you the second half because that kind of talks about episode two onwards. And I don't really want to do that because I do think so much of the joy of this is just being thrown into the deep and having to work out who's aligned with who and what and where, and then also what the heck am I even watching? What is this doing? So <laughs> okay. the line is, the series is based on the story of the captain uh, it's an unnamed character, but we just call him the captain. He's a North Vietnam plant in the South Vietnam Army. Okay, and that's all I'm going to say there. Good okay. start. That's but a good hook. While you've got that, uh, there's also, he's got a CIA handler involved as well. And in the first episode, that's played by Robert Downey Jr. Uh, there's, there's that Air America linkage right there. Robert Downey Perfect. Jr. in this... You remember when, uh, what's probably a good example of this? Uh, the Batman. Remember that movie that came out a couple of years ago where we had one Colin yes, Farrell. Yes, point of reference for everything. Yeah, yes. exactly. One Colin Farrell dressed up beyond recognition as Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin. And so people looked yeah. at it going, well, you're under all that makeup. Uh, like, why did you hire Colin Farrell to do that? It really could be any actor on that. Or why not just get like a heavy set gentleman who's an actor who would be great playing that role? Like, it seems weird laying them under all that stuff. Robert Downey Jr. is kind of doing the exact same thing in the first episode of this, in that he is fairly unrecognizable until you suddenly realize, wait, that's Robert Downey Jr. because I'm very familiar with this face and these many mannerisms. Um, so, exactly, yes. When you watch, he's got this crazy hair. He's got some um, less than perfect Robert Downey Jr. style skin. Uh, he's, you know, he's definitely going and hamming it up. He's playing it for every row, the back row, the front row, the row around the block. Like he is really going for it with this uh, performance there. But, and I'll give this away with it. Robert Downey Jr., he plays several roles throughout the run of the series. Mm, so God. you see him there at the beginning, but you're going to see him in other contexts as well as different characters. Uh, yeah. This is a surprisingly very funny, very human um, drama. Uh, 
there's a very dramatic moment that happens at the very end. Again, I don't want to say anything because it kind of just leads you to where it's all going. Okay. But it's very dramatic and something happens where I was genuinely, you know, I was, it was, I was excited, but also I was kind of emotionally sort of a little bit hit by what ends up taking place. It's a really absorbing TV show and I couldn't really recommend this one enough. Am I rowing this boat alone in that Robert Downey Jr., to me, has lost some of the technique, lost some of the skill that he displayed in his early roles as an actor and instead is has spent the best part of the last decade, and I absolutely include Oppenheimer in this, um, kind of playing to the back row a bit. What I'm really concerned about The Sympathizer is that he gets to play four roles under really heavy makeup, going <laughs> right to the end of the, going to the nth degree with what he's able to do with these characterizations. And that concerns me because um, there's a smugness about him, which really suits some characters like Iron Man, like Tony Stark, but it, it, it can be, it, it comes across as a little bit overplayed not very subtle acting in, in other hands. And it surprises me that I'm saying this because, like, Less Than Zero is, is as, and, and Air America, of course, these are his early films at Chaplin all those years ago that, that positioned him as a, a great young actor with a huge future. But the work he's done in the modern Hollywood stuff, I, I'm not as enamored with. Ultimately, you're really looking at the tension that exists between a Hollywood actor and a Hollywood star. Hmm. So when you transcend just being a Hollywood actor and become a Hollywood star, you are then suddenly entering into that Robert Downey Jr. sort of mode, where regardless of how downplayed a role may be, it's still hard to separate the actor out of the performance. Exactly. The thing sure. is, uh, I think people are got. You go into a Robert Downey Jr. performance, and you're just kind of expecting to see the star. Uh, I do think that roles like Oppenheimer, I, I don't think that Oppenheimer was made stronger by Robert Downey Jr. being cast in that. Okay, mm -hmm. but I do think the Sympathizer is made stronger by Robert Downey Jr. being cast in this. The reason for well, that so, is okay. because you watch this and you kind of do want a big, boisterous, loud performance in here and something which really stands out because nobody else in this cast is known. Uh, this is something where, you know, I, I think there's a strong danger with this drama of getting a number of viewers who don't really have something to just hook into immediately. Okay, and you kind of need mm. a little bit of a hook with this one. I think Robert Downey Jr. is that hook and he provides and he delivers and that's good, but not to the detriment of the rest of it. I watched Oppenheimer oh. and I couldn't stop thinking about Robert Downey Jr. being Robert Downey Jr. And even though he was doing some capital A acting in that, I still couldn't really stop him, stop seeing him as a star. Yeah. Yep. Totally agree. Well said. All right. So it's called The Sympathizer. Uh, it's on Max if you're one of our international listeners. Where is it screening in Australia? Uh, that would be on Binge. Uh, and also on it's on regular HBO in the US as well. It's a proper HBO oh. series. All right. Good to know. Finally, we get to the film that everybody, well, sort of everybody in our circle is kind of talking about. It's called Late Night with the Devil. You're meddling with things you don't understand. Whoa! Now, as you know, here on Night Owls, we think it's very important to keep an open mind. Please welcome Dr. June Ross Mitchell and Lily, the young subject of the book, Conversations with the Devil. I really don't think it's a good idea, Jack. It's becoming more unpredictable. That's a good thing. That's why we still do black TV. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned for a live television first. Late Night in the De with the Devil is from two Australian brothers, Cameron and Colin Cairns, who um, have taken f as their starting point for this, their inspiration for this, a certain Australian late night talk show host called Don Lane, who all of us are familiar with, if not being old enough like me to have remembered it. Um, they certainly know him as one of the legends of Australian television. Uh, he is brought back to life in a certain way by the great David Dasmalchian, um, who in this movie plays Jack Delroy, a late night talk show host. Um, who has a fondness for the supernatural. We uh, found early in the film that he is uh, involved with um, some uh, Southern Californian types who go off into the, the forest late at night and chant and conjure and do all those sort of things. Um, many, many years ago, I digress away from the, the Don Lane story, 
Donna Lane had on his show a gentleman called James Randi. James Randi was a skeptic and went about disproving a lot of the things that Don Lane uh, had uh, interest in, the supernatural, the paranormal. Um, he, Don Lane would often have on the show Doris Stokes, who was a British clairvoyant. Um, he would have on the show Yuri Geller, who was the famous illusionist who could claim to bend spoons with his mind. And in one very famous confrontation, James Randi and Don Lane almost came to blows on the set of, uh, during the taping of one of the Don Lane shows. So Late Night with the Devil uh, takes... As its starting point, this tension. Jack Delroy is having ratings problems um, during a sweep season. He decides to have on the show uh, June Ross Mitchell, played by Laura G Gordon, who brings with her a young woman called Lily, played by Ingrid Torelli, who uh, may be uh, in touch with a demonic spirit. And they plan to, on the show, uh, conjure this demonic spirit through Lily and broadcast it live as a bit of a sweep stunt, um, but also ignoring all the consequences and possibilities that could go wrong by doing such a thing. In the middle of all this is a character called Christo, played by Fas Albazzi, who is the James Randi type, who is the um, uh, sceptic who, who wants to poo-poo all of this, and, and uh, things go horribly wrong along the way. Um, this film opens with a terrifically edited montage sequence that is absolutely from that old school type of uh, documentary, something like Killing of America, where they go through these early, where they go through a whole lot of clips as to how the, the story is going to unfold and the main characters involved with the story. And in this case, it's voiced by the great Michael Ironside. So it's got this great sort of extended opening montage sequence. And then you get into this beautifully recreated uh, 70s late night television talk show set, set with an audience, with the, the crew, with the, the band and the, the um, uh, voice on the side, the sidekick, uh, Gus, played by Reese or Terry. And you've got this wonderful setup that then goes very, very dark when horrible things start to happen, when the, the spirit is conjured, when the demon starts to manifest through Lily. Um, it's all shot and all sort of and taken as a found footage type film. This is footage that uh, has been found and, and resurrected for the, the sake of this sort of faux documentary. Um, David Dasmalchian, who we all know from Suicide Squad and from Oppenheimer, the previously mentioned Oppenheimer, he is great as Jack Delroy. Um, I had a lot of fun with this. The premise doesn't quite hold up. The found footage construct kind of falls apart a little bit um, when some of the, the uh, behind the scenes footage is, is captured that wouldn't have really happened back in those days. But um, the fun I had with just seeing the period recreated, the uh, very wild and crazy uh, uh, payout at the end of the film, um, plus the, the great acting along the way, I think the Cairns brothers have made a really, really terrific and original little horror film. Yeah, so I saw this one a couple of weeks ago. I was fairly enthused about seeing it as a late-night TV enthusiast. Uh, I really think this is a really fucking stupid film. I really didn't care for it. Um, the further I get away from it, the more I really hate this film. Okay, so wow. there's, a, there's a couple of things. So my general sort of um, non-Dan Barrett's uh, reason that I didn't care for the film is that... We talk about it being a found footage movie. If it's going to be a found footage movie, then it needs to be a found footage movie. This violates the found footage-ness of it almost repeatedly throughout the film from little... Like, they try to justify it at the very beginning with a statement which says that the footage that you're seeing is a compile of um, footage that we're seeing from the broadcast as well as some behind-the-scenes footage that's also been recorded. But the yeah. behind-the-scenes footage just looks like the exact same footage as the TV broadcast. There's no change in video quality by any means. There's no... Uh, like, it doesn't seem like it's security footage, but also it's the late 70s. So why are the backdoor passages around the sets being recorded in this way? Like, why does the audio quality never really shift? Like, there's no visual cues at all to suggest that we're seeing different types of video footage here. Okay, it doesn't change yep. like aspect ratios. Like, there's just nothing, and that's really, really frustrating. And then you get to the point where this, um, what we're seeing, is all taking place sort of within his mind. How are we seeing this as a found footage movie? 
It makes absolutely zero sense. If they stuck to the integrity of the found footage concept, you could have done something really, really cool here. But instead, it's just kind of really dumb. Uh, but from a Dan Barrett just getting annoyed perspective, uh, there's no <laughs> late night show that operated in the US that's anything like this. The form and function of the program that they're watching here is a US daytime TV talk show. Okay, it's not night like it's not a late night show by any means. There's no comparison for it, and so you're watching, and it's like, well, you've violated the found footage element, and then also you haven't bothered doing any research to make this feel like a show that may have actually existed. So, where's well, the pleasure in this? And about... I just wasn't finding it. Yes, they said it in America, and it's an American star and, and and American people across the board. The actual set, which looks a little bit like blankety blanks more than any talk show, to be honest. Um, but the two chair set up without the desk, which I think you're referring to, that sort of standard American mm. talk, late night talk show sort of thing. Um, the chairs that they use in this was is much more Don Lane, so they, they're taking it yeah, from, but the, from that perspective and that point. But of if view. you look at the set framework, it's set up the same way a lot of daytime shows worked. So this is probably a bit more. Uh, oh gosh, why can't I think his name? Uh, Merv Griffin show than it is any of the late Merv night Griffin shows. Or a, yeah, or, a, a, yeah. or Mike Walsh here in Australia. And the thing like is, that, yeah. you introduced it talking about the Don Lane connections. If this had been a film where they'd set a behind the scenes of a Don Lane in Australia, like I don't think it's really taken away. Okay, like you could have just done that. But instead, by setting in the US, there's an entirely different framework that I'm working within, and it doesn't abide by that framework. Yeah, that's yeah. I, I get why that annoys you. I don't think that detracts from the actual film at all. But yeah, I I, I, I understand. Yeah, look, and and I do agree with you that setting it up as a, a found footage thing and introducing that whole uh, footage taken from the forest when they went out and chanted for the demons and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's kind of a long bow to pull, and you either you either sort of give the film the benefit of the doubt and go with that, or and you're not the first critic I've spoken to that says the whole found footage thing and the way it's all cut together doesn't really make sense. Um, I'm going to err on the side of, no, it doesn't, but it's, I still really found this entertaining and energetic and original as a film, and that was enough to pull, pull me out of the, pull me, you know, cut those moments some slack, whereas you kind of went the other way and say, no, they weren't, it wasn't enough. And so I, I get that. I, I've heard that before. But I think there's enough in there, and the ending was so much fun and so sort of visually interesting to, <sighs> to um, show that the, the film worked. Oh, look, it, it wasn't fun. I think the film had just well and truly violated itself so many times by the time it reached that end bit. Like, it wasn't earned, and it was weirdly telegraphed what was going on with it as well. Like, I, yeah, no, I was incredibly frustrated. I was polite mm -hmm. and didn't groan that much with my friend who'd invited me along to go and see that. But I kept it all to myself. But, yeah, I really just got frustrated by this terrible, terrible movie. It's called Late Night with the Devil. It is in pretty wide release. They've got a high hopes for this one. It's gone into most of the major chains um, and on the back of a fair bit of buzz out of the US um, ahead of its release on Shudder over there. Um, maybe it'll, it'll, it'll be that rare sort of Australian horror film that, that, that does okay at the box office. He's hoping. It's called Late Night with the Devil in cinemas now.